Welcome to Dealing with Difficult Clients. I'm Mark Fitman. I am really thrilled to be sharing this topic. I love the interest this topic has generated uh, because apparently we, we all have to deal with difficult people. And um, honestly, sometimes we are the difficult people, aren't we? <laughs> so um, I have, I want to share with you in this short webinar, I want to share with you a framework that I found to be incredibly helpful. Um, it was birthed out of an experience I had with a very difficult client. And um, then a strategy that you can put into practice, even right after this, after this training, that will help you to see maybe different ways to work with that particular person. And then I want to share an offer that I'm super excited about also um, that'll be at the end. So what we're going to do first is just think about a a client that you've had, if as you're using the chat so well, why don't you uh, put in the chat whether you are, if you're a coach, a consultant, uh, a manager of people, if if which one of those three fit you? Coach, awesome. So this is something that I see coaches and consultants have that consultant coach. Okay, I get that too. And a director, yes. Well, the um, many of us with, as coaches and consultants, sometimes we have the experience like I had that there was one particular client a few years ago who just couldn't seem to get out of his own way. He kept, kept having a success and accomplishments, but not in the areas that mattered most to him and not in the areas that he engaged me to work with him for. And that got me, started getting me really nervous. And in part, because I felt like I wanted the change for him more than he wanted it for himself. He kept seeing his limitations and he kept seeing other things that were in the way. Um, and every single phone call after that was sort of increasing stress because they just felt like I knew that we weren't going to necessarily get anywhere. Um, and I started to dread the phone calls as they were coming, the weekly phone calls on my calendar. I started to get really nervous about them. Now, for managers, this could be your direct report. I've worked with, I've coached a lot of managers and, and CEOs who have direct reports that just seem to have the same kind of one on one direct meeting every week. It doesn't seem like they go anywhere. Um, and you kind of, kind of begs the question what are you doing with your time? And don't you want to be doing something that would allow me to have an excuse to give you a promotion? Um, so that kind of stress can also be there. Just that whole, we're going to do this again. If you're, if you're finding yourself blowing off your direct report meetings because you don't think you'll have something to talk to with them, then this the framework I'm going to show you in here and the uh, strategy will probably be quite helpful as well. So Part of the reason for this, this, what this one guy's experience for me forced me to go back. I've been now coaching 18 years at that point, it was 15, having a coaching practice and it forced me to go back and look at that, look at my organizational leadership development, what I've, what I've learned in my master's program there. And also um, go back to my coach training and pull together what is the framework I'm about to share with you. What it gave me this, the peace of mind of every time I went into a phone call, I knew I had a toolkit that I could go to with over a dozen tools that allowed me to help him do his success in his own way. And that was the key thing, because as a coach, that's what you're trying to do is you're trying to get out of your client's way. You're not supposed to be in your client's way. You're supposed to bring out the, the brilliance of your client and help them reshift their perspectives and, and ask good questions as opposed to actually doing the work for them. And it was to the point where I wanted to just get on the phone and start calling some of the people that you needed to be calling because uh, he just wasn't getting over the, over the, the mountain. Now, with our, the people that are really difficult for us, Sometimes it's not their fault because whatever level of leadership we're in, and leadership is influence, it's not necessarily a title. So you might be influencing people um, to, in some area in your community service. And so that is a leadership thing too. But on our leadership journey, nobody's given a map. Nobody is really told this is exactly how, how your leadership journey is going to go. And um, for some people that stumble upon a map, um, they, they are think they have, may have found a map. They don't have anybody to decipher for them. <laughs> There's very few people that are able to say, this is where you're at. Um, maybe some of you have had this experience. When I was in my twenties and thirties, I asked for a lot of mentors. I would seek out specific people and ask them to be my mentor. And I don't know what I was doing. Well, I think my intentionality freaked them out because they didn't seem like, feel like they could offer me anything. So it was almost like I was calling a lifeline and, and, 
they were, people would actually turn me down quite regularly. People that I really esteemed and had finally gotten to the point of saying, Hey, I see this quality about you or this aspect about you, or this area, a character trait about you that I really admire. And I'd love it if we could, you know, get to have coffee on a regular basis, maybe every other week, maybe monthly, uh, because I'd like to pick up some of that totally freaked them out. So many of our clients are in that position too. If they're that intentional, there still aren't people that are able to decipher the map. The good news is in this process of working with this other client, I feel like I found a map and it seems to have fit for a lot, a lot of people. If you've read Surprising Gift of Doubt, this is in there as well. Um, the There's a, a four quadrant um, kind of framework. The vertical axis is the confidence axis. So start at the top is confidence and it goes down on shore. Then the horizontal axis is the inputs axis. It's the uh, external inputs and, or internal inputs. This frames the journey. And I, I've, as I've been sharing this for, for a while now, people have told me it's not just a leadership journey, but it's um, a human growth journey. There's a journey that happens in this process that people can identify with. I'm going to talk about it in terms of leadership, because as an executive coach, that's what I had first created this for. But think about your first step into leadership. Well, for the pro one of the problems with the map is that we're only given half of it. Many people don't even know that there's a whole other half. So our clients come to us or our direct reports come to us and they're either usually in the one or two category, uh, quadrant one or quadrant two. Quadrant one is where they started out in their job and they have a level of confidence either in their own abilities or in the, in the confidence and trust in the people that assign them the task to do. Somebody thinks that they have what it takes and so they're, they're, their confidence is as high as it's going to be and they look to external cues to figure out how to do it. So they try to copy leaders. They've seen parents lead. They've seen coaches lead. They've seen teachers lead, bosses lead. So they try to lead as well. And the <laughs> listening, I listened to a lot of motivational speakers growing up. And one of the things that the motivational speakers would say is that if you're a leader out leading and you turn around and there's nobody behind you, you're just out for a walk. That will take a hit at your confidence and you'll start going down in your confidence because my one of the classic examples I've seen is an introvert leader trying to mimic an extrovert boss. So extroverts are very people-oriented, touching people, tired, just being out in the crowd energizes them, walking around the office or getting on, you know, calling up people on the team if you're working remote. Um, the introverts try to do that and it totally drains them. All the spontaneity and the plan, unplanned activities are a conversation is can be very draining for an introvert. And if they don't know that about themselves, they start wondering, well, maybe, maybe something's wrong with me. Maybe I'm not the right person for this position. And so that as you go down that quad, the confidence quadrant, you go into quadrant two, which is the experiment quadrant. Now, experimenting is where you try to fix what's broken. And this is where so many of our difficult clients are at. This is where people come to us at. This is where our direct reports for the managers also tend to come to you at. And they have a problem and they're looking for a fix and they're looking outside of themselves for that fix. So this is where you could go to uh, certification programs. You could go to master's programs. You could uh, be, you know, go to webinars like this, podcasts, read books, take classes. They're all really good things to do. Um, but the in quadrant two, when you're doing them, it usually accentuates your brokenness. So as you're going in, in, into it, looking for time management skills, let's say. You're trying to figure out how to manage your time better. And you read a book that sounds like it's going to be perfect for you. It's going to answer all your problems. And, and the, the testimonials in the book say everything, their life, people's lives have been changed. Uh, and so you're, you're eagerly reading that book. And then maybe 10% of it is what you're able to use in your own life. So instead of being happy about that 10%, most of us look at that 90% and say, wow, I must be more broken than I thought. And so we kind of lurch from, from strategy to strategy from, I, I did this organizationally too. There was one organization I worked in that had fish sticks philosophy for a, uh, employee engagement thing. And then we lurched to raving fans. Then we lurched to, a, uh, another type of something from the studio group. We kept lurching from framework to framework. We learn a new vocabulary, learn new uh, things to track. And then we do that for a few years and somebody would get tired and we lurch to another one. Uh, for many of the difficult people in our life, they're in this lurching space and they don't see the great successes that they've had along the path or small successes. They just see the gaping 
ignorance that they have, the, the, that big doubt of, I just don't have what it takes. Um, they're sort of like the wizard of Oz, uh, the, don't look at the man behind the curtain. <laughs> um, cause they don't, they're, they're, a lot of them are afraid that they're about to be found out that they really shouldn't be in their position. When I did a leadership study with, uh, Adrian Sargent for nonprofit leaders, we found out that a full one in 10 nonprofit CEOs have zero confidence in their ability to lead. They feel like they should be somebody else. They need to move out of their position because somebody else needs to be in there. And there are, we all know leaders that should maybe feel that way, but not 10%. Uh, and the low confidence was, 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 uh, even bigger part of the pie, but I couldn't believe that one in 10 people that specifically took a leadership survey and did a study said they had zero confidence and they really felt like they're going to be found out. So the fact that they may need more people skills, the fact that they may need more time management, the fact that they need, may need, they have these things that are not, they're, they're not doing right is real. But as a coach and as a consultant has coaching in their practice or as a manager who's coaching, Part of our job is really to help them take their perspective and help them see a different perspective. So look at this picture. What do you see? Use the chat feature to see what, what do you see what in this image? Okay, this is a, a woman. Can you expand on that? Can you use an adjective with that? Oh, so, okay, someone sees a dressed up woman, Tina does. Some of you may have already, she, yes, she looks fancy. Okay, okay. So some of you have already have seen this before. It's a classic example of how there are actually two women in this photo and depends on your perspective. So the first one could be where you see the ear and the eye of a, a, a fancily dressed woman uh, with a nice feather going off at the top of her head. But other people, when they look at this, they see the nose, the the cheek becomes the nose is really a nose. And what was a nice necklace on the younger woman becomes a mouth. Um, and so it's an older lady versus a younger lady. Um, and, and boom, Lisa, I love that. Ah, I didn't see that until you pointed it out. That's our job as coaches, as, as we're using coaching in our different ways of interacting with people is to help people say, see, that their perspective isn't necessarily wrong. They are uh, people that saw the younger lady. They're absolutely right. It's there, but people that saw the older lady also saw that as well. And so what we get to do is change their perspective to see that there might be a different way of looking at the situation. The way I talk about that is we get to go to the second half of the map, which is the internal cues. These are the hard ones. Cause these are the ones that we're usually told not to do. They're woo woo. They're soft. They're emotions. You don't want to get caught up in those. But um, as a coach, our, as, if strictly coaching, um, and I'm, I'm you know, a big fan of coaching certifications, I'm a big fan of ICF, I'm on the board of our local International Coach Federation chapter, because coaches ask questions and help clients see things from a new perspective. Coaches don't get in and do the work, they hold space for the client to figure out their own answers to questions. And that's where the internal comes in really, really well. And that's where the other perspective, you get to, to ask different questions that can help with that. I call this the analyze step. If you don't have the privilege of having a coach and you're just doing this on your own, you can do this too. It's where you start looking at, hmm, I only get 10% of that time management book instead of the 90%. But maybe that's all I needed from that book. Maybe that was actually a benefit. I'm 10% better than before, as opposed to 20% worse or 90% worse. It's where you move in quadrant two, you're asking, why am I so broken? That doubt can push you over into quadrant three to ask, well, what if I'm the right person for the position? What if I'm exactly what is needed for this role? What if my organization is exactly, exactly the voice that needs to be heard in this conversation? And as coaches, that's our privilege and consultants that have coaching. And I know we have managers on here too. That's what we get to ask people. Okay. Yes. These limitations are there. What if in those limitations is where, why you're, you're here? What if you're the perfect person for this? What if your skill set's the perfect for this introvert boss? 
what if that's exactly what this this organization needs? How do we then struck? How do you start? What, what are ways you could structure your life so that you don't get drained all the time? Well, I could set up, I could close my door at certain times, or I could have um, uh, communicate office hours where people are able to come in, or I could structure when I go out and talk to people or when I get on the phone and call people so that I know it's coming and I can gear up for that and have some time to, to build up some reserve for that. So that's where we get to show them the other part of the map that Yes, there's this one perspective, but maybe there's this other. And as people start having confidence in building on their own wholeness, the external cues and the internal cues, then they're able to move up on the confidence scale in the quadrant four, which is, I call the focus quadrant. Now it's not nirvana. <laughs> I, I hesitated about calling it focused because a level of focus could seem like I've got it all figured out. Everything is grand. There's no more problems. We'll still have difficult people to deal with. That's not, I, as long as we're on this planet and as long as we're a people, a person, the, one of us will be difficult. <laughs> All of us have different quirks and different ways of seeing the world. But where the focus comes in is that you now have four quadrants to go to. And so as you're looking at the people, the clients you're working with, you might be able to say, which quadrant do they seem to be in? And many, many, many of the clients that come to coaches and consultants in particular are deep in the quadrant two space. They're deeply looking, they, they see their deficiencies and they're looking for help and a way out. They're looking for a fix. Um, we can then also see with our direct reports, uh, if we're on, if we also have teams that we're, that we're working with, where are they at? And each of the quadrants can teach us something positive about life and about leading and about influencing people. So it, none of them are bad necessarily. And usually we have to go through all of them. Now, hopefully that's the framework I wanted to share with you. This is, called, I call it quadrant three leadership. It is built out a lot more in uh, surprising gift of doubt because the analyze step is where that happens. Um, the reason I call it quadrant three leadership is that there are tools within this quadrant. Um, and that's where, when I was working with this one particularly tough client, I pulled together this diagram that helped me to figure out what are the tools that, my, uh, at, that are in my toolkit that I can draw on at any given time, instead of dreading the phone call, knowing that I have these here that I can work with. And then as I looked at this, I realized, hmm, this isn't, uh, more, this is zoomed in on a much, you know, if I were to zoom out, where are people at in their journey? And that's how I got the map, uh, created the map. Uh, the quadrant three tool sets are largely clumped into hardwiring. What is your behavioral hardwiring, your ability hardwiring, your motivational hardwiring? There's the identity, which is the stories you tell yourself. What is it? How do you orient yourself in the world based on, on story? And all of us do it. Uh, the studies are pretty clear that human beings are storied creatures. Our operating system is story. Uh, we often are trying to explain things that happen to us. And that's as we start getting more objective or analytical about our stories, we're able to then realize some of the programming may, may not serve us anymore. Then our goal setting too, often many of our clients and even ourselves are doing goals the wrong way. We may be very good at goals, but we're not looking at the whole person. We're just looking at a subset of our person. And so we're limiting um, our, our ability to, to succeed by setting our goals wrong. The overlapping parts of this Venn diagram, I call it personal style, mission, and values. Um, as we help the people that are, we're working with understand their values, they can then make decisions more quickly because even if they don't know the exact data and they haven't that every they don't have all the details yet, they can still sense on if it's in line with their values or in line with their organizational values. And here's a freebie. I wasn't thinking of putting this in, in this training, but one of the uh, benefits of doing your own values exercise, especially if you're working in an organization, well, I guess if you're self-employed too, is that you can then do your organizational values and see if there's overlap. Uh, a lot of people are under stress because it turns out their organizational values aren't either clear at all or are at in conflict with their own personal values. And if you're self-employed, that can still happen too. <laughs> I'm self-employed. I understand that that could be a reality for sure. Uh, when we're working in all of those areas and we have, they're all tools within, you know, there's, there's lots of different strategies within each of these areas, but when we're helping our clients work in them, then I call it the integrity model because all the pieces are integrated together and we're starting to fire on all cylinders and we start understanding and having a vocabulary for why we orient to the world the way we do. Um, we're not throwing out the external. 
the external benchmarks and studies and all can be helpful um, as touch points, but we also know why we do choose to do things differently uh, if we choose to. And that's where that confidence can grow. And we can uh, be in ourselves and also in the people that we're the difficult clients we're dealing with. Now, I want you to, we're going to shift from the framework into the strategy. And I want you to think of the, don't put their name in the chat. <laughs> this is being recorded, so we don't need that. But think of the person that you're having the most difficulty with right now. And, uh, and then also tell me in the chat, have you ever heard of a person named Karen Horney? She was a psychoanalyst around the time of Freud in Germany. Yes or no, one or two. Yes for one would be yes, two would be no. Okay, no, great. Two no's, yes, awesome. Okay, so I ran into her framework of instinctual stances through a teacher named Suzanne Stabile. I do a lot of training with the Enneagram with my clients and uh, Suzanne Stabile is one of my favorite Enneagram teachers. But the Enneagram can be complex. It's a nine type point typology. There are three types underneath each type. And so there are 27 types and it can seem really com complex. Most clients that I've been working with, when they're having a difficulty with one of their, their people, one of their team, this three instinctual stance framework just frees them up. It makes sense to them and it immediately helps them. Um, the, the, so Dr. Horney was, uh, make was working on just kind of identifying people psychoanalyst and analytical work uh she's credited as being the first fe feminist psychoanalyst and she was uh figuring out that there are like 10 she thought about 10 different traits that were were typical uh, and as she continued working i'm glad we got her as she refined the process to find that there are three instinctual traits, three ways of people orienting in the world. I would put this in the personal style, uh, somewhere between the hardwiring and the identity sections on the quadrant three leadership. The three stances are aggressive, dependent, and withdrawn. So the aggressive is the person on the stairs, the dependent is the, the two hands holding, and the withdrawn is the person reflecting. It looks like they're taking a nap, but they're, they're more reflecting and pondering under the tree. The aggressives are future focused, fast paced. They believe that the any solution to any problem is out in the future and it just has to be created. The future hasn't happened yet. So we have we can totally change it. We can do whatever, we can make it happen. Uh, when lockdowns happened uh, in March of 2020, that would the aggressives are the ones that are saying, we got to get busy. We got to do do something. And they were they they also tend to like social recognition. So think about your most your most uh, difficult client right now. Uh, they may be aggressive and wanting to move beyond reflection, where part of the whole helping them shift their perspective is getting them to do a little self reflection. So that's where they, their growth may be. Dependents are more present tense. They see the solution. They know there's a solution to problems, and it's in the people around them. And so they just need to keep talking to enough people around them and, and interviewing or, or checking in with the people around them and the, the solution will emerge. Uh, when the shutdowns happened in March, 2020, that really freaked people, the aggressives out because they're like, why are you talking to all these people? We need to get active. We need to do more, be more, you know, kind of th they were out in the future. The dependents couldn't figure out the aggressives at all because we have to figure out where our team is. How are you doing? Like all those check-in calls that turned out to be incredibly powerful for so many organizations and teams were probably inspired by dependents just reminding us, hey, we need to we need to bring the team along with us. We can't just be always shooting off into the future on our own. Um, so the your if your person is a dependent, they're a difficult person, then their challenge may be actually implementing. They, we don't need to talk to, every, you know, they may be always wanting to talk to somebody else before they actually take action on something. Um, and so how, helping them feel a little bit more confident in beta testing or doing uh, trial tests or whatever the wording you use to help them just experiment for the next week. Why don't we try this and see how it goes and we can report back. And that iterative uh, processing and growth can be a, a, gro a growing tool for them. Now, withdrawns are wonderful people. Their orientation is to the past. They want to know how things came to be. They want to create an unassailable solution. So they want to, they'll close their door and they'll study and they'll reflect and they'll think and dream, but they want to only present something when it's 
can't be criticized, when it won't fail. Um, and they also have this interesting twist of wanting to create a solution that has minimal impact on themselves. Um, withdrawns often will see the problems that exist around an organization or a team, but not realize that it's theirs to do. They'll, they'll just, it's kind of like walking down the street. Oh, look, there's litter on the side there. They don't identify that maybe they're the ones that are there to pick up that litter. Withdrawns get really frustrated with dependents and aggressives because we have to think more. How did we get to this point? What's the history of this? What's the continuity to this? Um, and, you know, dependents and aggressives can get very frustrated with withdrawals because it seems like they're closing their door or just checked out at times. Uh, all of this, we need all of them. We need people that are in the future th thinking forward. We need people that are in the present keeping the team together. And we need people that are in touch with the reflection of the past and the capacity to actually process that data. So now thinking of the person who is most difficult you're working with right now, what stance would you say that they're in? Would you say that they're in the aggressive, the dependent, or the withdrawn stance? Withdrawn, dependent. And what's the, for those of you who answered withdrawn, overthinker, yeah, overthinking, yeah, I get that. Uh, where for those of you who've answered, uh, what stance do you think your describes you more closely? Okay, You're aggressive. And your challenges with the dependent. Okay. Anyone else have a stance that they think they're in? Dependent. Okay. Um, in between, ah, I love that answer. Thank you for saying, uh, I'm between aggressive and dependent. One of the wonderful abilities of this is that once you know that there are three, there are choices, you can then flex. What does this position need? What does this, what does this space need? What does this, um, this crisis need? What does this opportunity need? Um, I know personally, I'm an aggressive. I always are trying to, um, you know, work really fast, processing really quickly. The problem with aggressives is that when the celebration is happening and the confetti is dropping and everybody's celebrating something well done, aggressives aren't usually around because they're on to the next thing. Um, and I know that there are times that my client needs me to be more in the dependent stance of just checking in or in the withdrawn stance of holding space just by being quiet and letting them process. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you like a good, a good celebration. <laughs> um, and a lot of you, oh, that's great. The, I, I'm glad you said that Tina, cause the between aggressive and dependent, um, really helps is helping, uh, identify many of the people on this call. Knowing this, as you, as we looked at the, I promised a framework, um, a, a strategy and an offer, um, knowing this, the framework of the map. Uh, and knowing the the strategy of working with the three different types, which is just one of many strategies, but it's a a can be a a, a just a quick sheet of okay, I'm getting irritated here, and I know my tendency. I wonder if I'm getting irritated because of interpersonal things, or is it because of other things that I can point out with this person? And part of for you as a coach, consultant, or manager, it could be that you're perfectly situated there because you're not that stance and you're able to show the different perspective from your stance perspective. Uh, for me as an aggressive, it's uh, working with those overthinkers, Rob. Um, I, I get the overthinking because I'm often in my head, but um, I also get the power of rapid iteration and trying things. And I know you do too. And um, that it's okay if it's not perfect. Sometimes good enough is good enough. And that's not settling for or mediocrity that's moving forward and seeing what what is actually going to gain traction what we can grow on and so having the understanding on ourselves of the different personalities we have or the tendencies and having some different frameworks that we can draw on from that can cause us to be even more helpful with the difficult people in our in our practice or in our life and that's where that like i said that's in the, i would put i would put that in the personal style part of quadrant 3 leadership which is with uh their you know in between hardwiring and identity, because part of it is your hardwiring, but part of it's also the story about how you process your world. And the map that I shared also, just remember the four quadrants of leadership. Um, the 
many, many, just knowing that many of the people that are come to us are kind of in that space of, of being afraid that they're going to be found out. Um, and I don't know if the, the coach is on the call. Um, so sometimes that can be a hard one to market to because despite the fact that our top athletes get hyper-focused coaching on very specific aspects of their craft um, or of their game, their sport, their athletic prowess, um, we still tend to think there still seems to be a thing in our, in our many parts of many organizations that coaching is for the people that are deficient as opposed to the high performers. Uh, and as Carrie Lauren said in Spanish Control, high performers, it's hard for them to ask for help anyway, because you're just used to things coming, getting done around them or getting the stuff done themselves. And they don't think that they need to ask for help. But knowing that that's where they're coming to can help us also with that perspective shift of, as we're talking to them early on is figuring, or, or in our next calls, what's the perspective that they're seeing? What, what is the image they're seeing? Maybe we can help them see the other, other lady that's in that image as well. The joy that's released from that, as you can tell, is I'm pretty excited about it. It can be two ways too. Like I, with my client, um, and I've since used this and taught this around, uh, around the country, not yet around the world, around the world through Zoom, I guess. Um, the, the release um, with my own, within myself of just feeling like, oh yeah, I don't have to solve this problem. I need to help ask better questions and give different frameworks or offer different ways of perspective shifting to help this person kind of get unstuck. And um, I just saw this particular person, I just saw um, the, a huge accomplishment that they've done. Um, and it's, it's amazing to see this years later, uh, the traction that this type of perspective and what coaching can do for a client, because it's internal, they get to, they'll keep it with them. They don't have to remember necessarily, what was it the coach said? Because it's stuff that you're helping them reflect on of themselves. But it can also be, so it can be making us, our jobs a lot more enjoyable because we know that we've got this toolkit to go to. Um, and it can also be enjoyable for the client, making it easier for them to refer us to either grow our practice, grow our consulting practice, or re, you know, refer us internally for whatever promotions we're thinking of or uh, helping if we're a leader that wants more people to be considering coaching. That can be an internal buy-in by having them realize, oh my goodness, I'm getting more done. Um, my manager is amazing. Uh, so that kind of referral thing can grow our influence and our practice uh, as well. Like I said, a lot of this is, uh, this is all in a surprising gift of doubt. What I'm, I'm excited at the time of this recording that the audio book is coming out this month as well. Woohoo! So um, that will be an on audible. And the offer that I wanted to just share with you all is the, co the quadrant three coaching certification. Um, I'm glad you need to revisit this section. That's great. Um, the, uh, I've put all this in 2004, so 17 years ago, I wrote my business plan a year after going into business for myself. I know I'm aggressive. I just started a business and then realized I should probably plan this. And in 2004, 17 years ago, I said, I want to have a coach certification process, but I didn't want to just be a paper printer. I wanted it to be something solid. So I wanted to, first of all, have a, a, a an established and growing practice of my own. Um, and I also wanted to have coaches that were, that were coming to me, asking me to help them with coaching one-on-one. -on -one. And over the last 17 years that's happened, I've had, uh, been privileged to coach, uh, consultants and coaches. I've also been able to train coaches in coaching. Um, there was one point in Colorado Springs, I was with 110, uh, coaches that were asking me to train them. Um, and that just were some of the external validations of the, the perspective that I'm sharing with in this certification are, are more than just printing a piece of paper. It's actually learning uh, a framework that and, and learning tools that you can use. And it's also learning how to grow your business through that, whether it's internally within an organization or externally with new clients. Uh, it's 12 weeks. We're going to look at each of the areas of Quadrant 3 in depth, look at the ways that your tools that you're already using can fit into those if you want them to, and look at other tools that you may not have thought of. Um, you're going to get workbooks for each of the sections. You're also going to get a, you know, the certification uh, for Quadrant 3 leader, as a Quadrant 3 leadership coach. Um, there's also going to be licensing to, and, and you'll get the Surprising Gift of Doubt slides. So you can give the Surprising Gift of Doubt talk, which involves the map and um, sections of more in-depth sections of the tools, or it's a longer talk. Uh, you'll be licensed to use that forever. So you don't have to, uh, or you, yeah, you'll be licensed to use that. So you don't have to create new 
new things, you can actually start giving a new keynote or giving a new workshop or training uh, without having to do it. It's already been done for you. Uh, and then we're also going to be growing this community of Quadrant 3 leadership coaches. So we'll have a uh, three, at least three months of coaching afterwards. So you can actually take the stuff you've learned in the first three months and then put it into practice and see what works for your, your style and your process. Um, super excited. The first class is in the middle of September. So love if you want to learn more information or you want to apply uh, to, to uh, be considered for acceptance, you can go to the, the URL you see on your screen, conqueredleadershipgroup.com slash coaching dash certification. Um, that's what I wanted to share with you. Framework, strategy, offer. Love to hear. What, are there questions that you all have? I love the way you're using the chat. Thank you. Um, it's so, I can feel the energy coming through, <laughs> through the camera and through the chat. So there, are there questions that you have, or it, was this something that, do you think this is something you could use with that difficult client or other clients that maybe aren't so difficult? I didn't freeze. I'm just waiting. <laughs> Nice. Thanks, Lisa. I'm relieved to hear I'm not the only one who just jumped into business. <laughs> it was one of those really, I, part of the time I was coaching, I was employed also. And I loved doing trainings and having coaching clients while I was also employed by an organization. Uh, they, they knew I was coming in with my own practice. And one of the best parts of it was I reminded myself the stuff I needed to be doing on my job. <laughs> So like talking to clients about business planning and realizing, oh, I should probably have goals that I'm shooting for as well. Awesome, Rama. Yeah, you're skilled. You're very skilled at this. So I'm, I'm honored that this was something that I was giving you to reflection too. That's great. Well, if you, um, I'm here to help. If you ever want uh, to reach out, uh, my email is mark, M-A-R-C at concordleadershipgroup.com. Really hope you'll check out the certification as well. And, um, oh, and remember that those three strategies um, is just one of the many ways. There may be things that you're already doing that probably are that will help you to have a different level of conversation with the people that you're having the most difficulty with um, and really help them get out of their own way. Uh, that's, that's what the whole thing of coaching is about. So thanks everyone. Thanks for helping change the world.